What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on the Soren Baker Show. Thank you for liking, subscribing, downloading, sharing everything on Unique Access and on the Digital Soapbox Network. As you know, we're trying to bring you guys great interviews every week and a wider range of people. You know, we've been having great artists on. We've been having great executives on. We've had personalities. And today's guest, I'm very excited to bring into the building to the Soren Baker Show because I've known uh, Defari for since the 90s and loved a lot of his music, had a lot of talks with him over the years, personally, professionally, and this is a reunion of sorts. I haven't seen him in a while. Yes. We've uh, kept in touch talking and stuff here and there, but we haven't actually sat down together for a long time, so this is going to be a, a great episode. So without further ado, Defari. Yes. Thank you for coming through, sir. Uh, Soren, this is, you don't even understand, uh, truly an honor and a great uh, rekindling, if you will, great retribute if you will um just being able to sit here with you like you said i mean if you think about it going on mm, getting a couple close times to yeah. <laughs> few decades <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're a man of a certain age i guess <laughs> but uh for those that need a refresher God and good. we're going to be good getting into all this today of course but the far I, has had a uh, a great solo career, also part of the Liquid family, the Liquid crew. Yes, sir. Done many, many, many dozens of collaborations with some of uh, the West Coast finest artists from Dr. Dre to Exhibit to Dilated, etc. And we're going to be getting into all that today. But I think it's important for those to kind of do a rewind and, and um, kind of set the stage and set the table, you know, prior to your, your career being a teacher um, back in Inglewood. Yes, sir. And I think it's interesting on many levels because you ended up being a successful artist touring, touring the world and, you know, being on albums, selling millions and millions of copies in your own solo career in addition to all of that. But as a kid, what made being a teacher something that you wanted to do? And then how did you end up focusing on the disciplines that you did? That's an interesting question because um, I come from a family of educators. Uh, my mother was a retired Head Start teacher. My aunt and uncle are um, retired uh, administrators for Santa Monica Malibu School District. Um, my godmother was a master teacher for LA Unified. So I think um, I didn't go to Cal looking to become a teacher. I got a degree in sociology from Berkeley and it just organically that intermittent year of I was thinking I was going to law school or and then I end up applying to a school of education because I was long term subbing during that sort of hiatus at a Berkeley high school and I guess innate talents that I didn't even know I had mm -hmm. just kind of came out in that process so myself and and, and uh Kwam superstar Kwam Ala, uh, John Patton, my good brother, we both ended up, uh, I applied to UCLA grad school and Columbia, and we both ended up going to Columbia Teachers College, mm -hmm. getting our master's in education. Um, so it was something, it was It was more like, uh, when I look back on it, uh, uh, you know, for me being a person of faith and, and, and believing God has his hand on me my entire life, um, God just ordered my steps and I just followed them, you know, and uh, I was organically able to succeed at, at teaching. I, I had I had a knack at it, and when I was at Inglewood, I was, you know, I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't dig the gig. I would always tell people I, I didn't really dig the gig as much as I, I dug the kids. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So. And what was the difference? Well, the gig you were highly underpaid and 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 highly overworked. Right. You know. Um, so that's the American way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So I would have been on an administrative track mm -hmm. um, at the time when Focus Daily came out. My first album, that was my last year of teaching. So I had had a plan prior to that to get myself into an administrative track in education, mm -hmm. you know, on, on a path of superintendency or something like that. I think I just made a word up, but superintendency. Yeah. It Congratulations. Good. It sounded good. Didn't it? Coming to a dictionary near you. Right. Um, so 
fortunately, I had another road I could travel at the time. And, you know, there's no looking back for me in my life. I'm I'm going forward at all times. So I've never been a person who would say, man, I wish I would have. Right. Or what would have happened if I? So, you know, I, I gambled on myself. And there you go. Tommy Boy deal and you know the rest. Hit the odds and evens. Yeah, man. Yeah, which we'll man. get to later. But Pick a number. Yes. With uh, Tommy <laughs> Boy, one of the things that I remember, because I knew who you were from ABB and the, and the singles and stuff. But Yeah, man. The thing that I was intrigued was that Tommy Boy, when they would hit me up, like, oh, you need to write about the FAR and everything. And I knew who you were, so they didn't even have to, like, quote, unquote, sell me on it. But it was intriguing to me that they were promoting the fact you were a teacher. Yeah. Because as we both know, a lot of times the rap, uh, the people at the labels like to promote the salaciousness of things. Absolutely. And for you, it was kind of the polar opposite. Right. And the timing of that yeah. may be in vogue today. Mm. I think they were somewhat out of touch then. Uh, a flip side of that coin, some could say, well, they were ahead of their time in thinking, <laughs> right. right? They would say that. Yeah. But you're right. To promote that aspect ver versus just my local prowess. Yeah. You know, um, it added to a little bit of a story, mm -hmm. but I don't think it was the, the the magnanimous story that they thought it would be. Right. You know, because it wasn't, it, it has to be a tremendous story to the artist. And if it's just more like, oh, I was a teacher, cool. Right, like, you, you can't, I can't create something for you, Soren. Right. And then make you believe it the way I believe it, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that that was their, their problem. And then we did the video. Here's the thing a lot of people should know about Focus Daily, which arguably, to most of my fans, is my biggest album. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a... Juice Magazine, top 50 album in Europe of all time, hip hop. And I was, I was ahead of my time. I, you know, I was pointing at the forum. I was, you yes. know, I was, I was wearing the, the Defari Laker jersey and stuff. So it would have been good if Tommy Boy rallied around the local mm -hmm. prowess, I say again, of what I had going on. Right. You know, um, but the teacher stuff was good. It was something to talk about. You know, something to talk about. And in that era of your career, and then, of course, in bigger rap, I thought it was interesting with what you and Dilator were doing with ABB in particular because, as you're well aware, and I want to get into this too, but, you know, back in the 80s in particular, once rap started getting on record, a lot of people would have the 12-inch deal. They wouldn't, they could graduate to an album but they didn't necessarily by default get an album deal. Absolutely. So for you guys, or you in particular as a solo artist, and you know I know Dilated's story, of course, but for you, did you, was the the mindset of, like, I just got to keep making these great 12 inches at the time, or was it like I'm always going to do an album and it's just a matter of time, or like how was that mentality for you since that was abnormal for how the rest of the industry was working in 96, 97, 98. I mean, you pretty much nailed it in terms of the dichotomy of where my psyche was. Mm -hmm. um, I was a singles, I was a 12 inch man. You know, I was, I was a single guy making, focusing on singles. That's how I got my deal. Right. Uh, Bionic. And then we came with People's Choice and then, then the rest was history thanks to Chris Atlas. And what a lot of people should know in this this little bit of history is when I signed, they signed me along with like 25 other groups. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, exactly what you said, Soren, came to fruition for 99% for of those groups except me. Mm -hmm. I did come out with more than a single on, mm -hmm. on Tommy Boy Black Label. I came out with a full album. Right. Maybe only two other groups came out with a full album at that time. Everybody else, man, they would just got a little bit of money, a little bit of advance money, a little single, and boom. They, they, they were smothered by the huge ocean out there. So the fact that I did come out, 
I think a huge factor in that was my affiliation because right. as you very well know, Soren, when we came through, it was important who you were affiliated with. Absolutely. You know, uh, just just being on your own and coming out was difficult. Mm -hmm. So me being affiliated with the Alcoholics and King T exhibit was literally on his ascension the same time I yep. was. Um, and so he and I, we formed a strong bond. And, you know, Focus Daily was meant to showcase my affiliation with mm -hmm. Liquid Connection. That was the first single in the video. Right. The idea, and this is what I was promised, was we're coming back, we're going to do 405 Fridays. Right. So now I can <laughs> showcase my solo abilities. Mm -hmm. And Tom Silverman and them just, they never pulled the plug. You know, they, it was more of an annulment than a divorce because it was, it was so <laughs> fast. You like know? it never happened. Yeah, yeah. But um, tied into that, is the interesting dichotomy of coming out and establishing yourself and then relying on the affiliation to the fans right. and how that's perceived because, you know, for people, you know, everybody I think to a large degree will look at West Coast rap, of course, as being gangster rap. but And then they'll have... If they know, then they'll be like, oh, well, there was Tone Loke and Young MC and The Far Side and these other right. groups. Right. But the thing that I've always thought was interesting, and you're a prime example of this, as is the Liquid Crew, especially with King T, um, since the beginning of his career, is that the Liquid Crew's music, Alcoholics included, and of course, Exhibit, but there's a lot, it's super street at the same time. Yeah. And I think people because I guess it's not so overtly gangster and overtly profane or overtly gang referencing with every other word. And it has to sound like East Coast. Right. Or it has to sound like or, New York, you know. And, and why? Let, let alone the loop packs. Uh, yeah. The loop packs, um, you know, with their gift to hip hop, you know, that's, that's liquid. Yeah. Mad Lib Invasion. Absolutely. So that being said, why do you think there is that disconnect from how people look at, you know, the crew that you guys had and not really look at it, quote unquote, as street music in the same way that they look at gangster rap? As it's street. pretty simple, uh, that answer. It has to do with the music itself, mm -hmm. not even the lyrics. It has to do with the beats. It's the sound. It's the sound of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If it's not G-Funk, then it's New York. <laughs> and it's just that simple. Right. Period. End of story. You know what I'm saying? Unless we're taking it back to your Rodney O's and Joe Cooley's and, and, and stuff like that, which is funny because that that right there is your trap music. Of today. Everlasting yeah. bass. Absolutely. And trap has recycled Rodney O and Joe Cooley and all of that. As evidenced by so many people sampling Everlasting Bass till today. Till today. You know. um, one of the best beats slash breaks slash all that, man. Yeah. That that song, um, <laughs> I mean, I was living in Maryland still, of course, as a young man when I first heard that song. And I just remember thinking, like, this is, like, one of the most incredible beats I ever heard. Uh, it, I mean, it's a classic, super classic. You know, it's 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 that feeling of rap at the time definitely west mm -hmm. you know it gives you that feeling uh, you could tell like even how too short and then we're influenced by by a record like that you know oh yeah absolutely and taking it back for you uh one record that i know and i don't recall us ever talking about this over the years but Tila Rockets, yours, oh, I yeah. know, is one of your all-time favorite records. Yeah. That's and like my vert. I have these vertebrae records that kind of make up the spine of the far eye. Yeah, that's one of them. So Tila Rockets, yours, for those that don't know, is an early Def Jam release. Yes. And it's also one of the songs and Tila Rock as an artist. They're two, him as an artist and the song is yours are super influential and super important, but literally very few people know about them yeah and that's something so defari i'd like for you to explain from your perspective why it's yours and tila rock were so significant to you and why they're so significant to rap history well 
that particular record, the beat gives me that 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 globe and the whiz kid, you mm-hmm. know, to play that beat feel mm-hmm. with the claps. And of course the eight oh eight, the T R eight oh eight. But his rhyme patterns were ahead. They were way ahead. Mm-hmm. Those same rhymes would be relevant today in terms of the pattern and how he spaced it out. Nobody was doing that. So that that song blew my mind. It it was um the thing about music is because I'm I'm a music zealot, man. I mean, I live and breathe music um, of all genres, you know, of a lot of genres. And, and music has to connotate a certain f- tangible feeling. So, like, when you listen to War, you know, Cisco Kid or Why Can't We Be Friends or, uh, you know, Love My Baby Brother, you, you it feels like the streets. Mm-hmm. It feels like you're outside. It has energy. Yeah. It has a certain energy. But it feels like you're outside and there's a bunch of people just all around. It just feels like the streets. Like salsa feels like the streets, you know, with the congas and whatnot. So Tila Rock was that. It was just the, the paradigm of what rap, how it made me feel, mm-hmm. you know. It, it, it was just everything was in that song. And then I hear Eric B. and Rock M's, um, Eric B. as president. Right. And then, it, you know, it, it was over. But it, it, even before that record, because that's the record that made me want to write rhymes, was the Eric B. as president. Okay. But even before that record, I can only get a certain feeling from this type of music, the Tila Rock, Schooly D, PSK, and Gucci Time, it, it, Mantronics. They gave me that feeling of rap that it just, the gravitas, it just right. drew me to the music, and I, I could never look back, you know. Yeah. For me, it just made me want to be involved in the game. Right. Uh, because, you know, being in Maryland, there was no music industry. <clears throat> and my parents were both teachers. Mm-hmm. So I had no way in the game. And then it was basically just go go. Um, right. And go go, even though I was very young, I understood that that was very localized. Mm-hmm. It's basically just an indigenous music and it wasn't going anywhere. Absolutely. So. Charles Brown and everybody. Chuck Brown. Chuck Brown. Yes, but uh, <laughs> all my heroes in Go Go. But um, absolutely, the uh, I love Go Go music. Oh, it's it's amazing, and you know, growing up in Maryland and being able to go to D.C. all the time since I was twenty miles away, you know, it's just it was a magical time to be able to watch that music. And yeah. I'll never forget. I'm not gonna say the artist's name because I don't want to disrespect them. But the story is amazing. I'll never forget. I was at the Capitol Center, uh, which held about 18,000 people. And <clears throat> this one artist who had two or three songs on the radio and was huge from New York at the time, he was listed as the headliner per se, right? So when he went off the stage, he thought the show was over, but he didn't realize Rare Essence was coming on after him. And he didn't realize, no offense to him, because we loved him. And they remade his records in the Go-Go records on the radio. That's how big this was. Right. When he got off stage, I'll never forget. I had good tickets to that one somehow. <laughs> and I saw him come to the side of the stage because <clears throat> he heard everyone clapping like for an ovation. But then he wasn't supposed to come back because he was done. And he was kind of like, I saw him kind of on the side of the stage. And then Rare Essence came out and then it was over. That's what they were there for, really. Right. And that uh, that just blew my mind um, because it was 18,000 people. Right. And it was just like, you know, it was a normal Go-Go concert, but it was a rap and um, Go-Go bill. But, uh, you know, that just always showed me how magical Go-Go is. And well, it, it's it, just a shame that... It touches you know, on the importance of locals. Yes. When there was a time where, yo, this is what they do out here. Right. And it's it's just here. Here. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, videos were the beginning of things unifying that, starting to unify that. And then once we got to the, you know, the internet and, and, and all the social media, well, now everybody does the same thing everywhere you go. Right. But, like, even L.A., I mean, we were on our own. When I'm in high school, L.A. is its own place. You'd have to be out here to hear right. the stuff that we were playing. You no, know, I, I remember even later than that, just 
I remember going to middle school and taking Living Like Hustlers to middle school. And no one in my school had any idea. I had it on cassette. <clears throat> and I bought it because I knew no one else would buy it. Right. And I just remember my friends just being like, what is above the law? Like, right. they thought it was like a movie or right. something, you know, the Steven Seagal movie or something. But I was like, nah, this is, this is going to be one of those groups right here. Yeah. And it was just, it's just crazy how all that, m the waves of music and how things uh, reverberate with people, which leads us nicely into the Odds and Evens album of yours because that's my favorite album of yours. Well, thank you. And that's one of my favorites too. It's not your favorite though. Well, they, they're like my kids, so yes, true. I, don't, I don't necessarily have a favorite. You know, like even my latest one, Solamente, is 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 one of my favorites. Okay, you know, I can appreciate that. Yeah. But um, that one has, like you were saying, with the war, uh, that group. You know, when you listen to Odds and Evens, to me, it has that sort of energy. Yeah, because a lot of the samples on there and and how the production is handled. Uh, throughout the album yeah so sonically that was in my opinion the best example of that in your discography so for you looking back what do you think sonically is different about that project than maybe some of the others uh probably well two things you know one i, I was now i had more experience mm -hmm. in the game so i kind of knew what i wanted and then the lifestyle I was living, I mean, you know, I was cowboy, man. <laughs> so, so that X Wild Cowboy, you know, <laughs> which was, oh, I love that album, by the way. That was one of my favorite albums. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was cowboy and I was steeped in a lot of iniquity, man. And, you know, we were hot. Liquid. I was going to say, I see, I saw some of it. <laughs> yeah. Liquid was hot. Right. E Swift was on fire. Through the roof. Through the roof. Yeah. Ev you know, was keeping up with E. Swift. You okay. know what I'm saying? And um, you see the covers in Vegas, and I'm, I'm on the back with, I don't know what's going on, one <laughs> shirt sleeve on and hanging <laughs> off, and I'm looking at the two-way. That's what's funny. I'm looking at the two-way. Um, so, yeah, man, it was just, it was that go time. Mm -hmm. And then, it, it, But street music actually, sonically, I thought, is a more bumping album. Then either odds or odds and evens and focus daily. Um, street music is a thumper. It is. I think the beats. To your point, I think it's a harder album. Yeah, and it definitely thumps harder. I think. What I liked about odds and evens is, you had this might be a bad example, but something that speaks to that is the uh, say my name, spell my name yeah. on the album. Yeah, because it has more. It's a harder sound to it, but it still works in well with that album where street music is much on a harder sonically. Yeah. <clears throat> in my opinion. Yeah. Cause I got Mike city involved and you know, we got, it, it, it's, it's a little more, yeah, you're right. More. Yeah. Hood beats. Mm -hmm. So to speak. I, I concur. That being said, one of the songs that I liked and I think is important as you know we're both fathers was for the love song yeah because that one you not only paid homage to your father but a lot of the important men in your life yeah and man. i think that as we both are well aware in rap that's a rarity that we have you know people celebrating uh the men in their lives the elders in their lives in such a profound way so what made that a, something you wanted to do, and B, why did you do it on that album at that time? Man, just, you know, that's a heavy question. With It's a pretty simple answer. It's just introspection, you mm -hmm. know, just wanted to pay tribute. Um, I wanted to flip up the concept of For the Love mm. on, some, um, on some brother love, you know what I mean, on some brotherhood, and um, what better way to do it than to talk about Pops and my uncle and then my stepdad, rest in peace. Mm hmm um, and, and in hindsight, that's why that's a huge song, one of my top songs, just because, you know, he, he passed after that was recorded, but to have that in the banks right. and he heard it, you know, um, and it's funny, I haven't even thought about it nor talked about that. And so now, here it is coming to light. And that was such a, a blessing to have that happen, that he was able to hear that before he passed, you know? 
Yeah. I mean, that's one of my favorite songs on the album. And I think it's... Swift. Yeah. It's one of my favorites that you've done, period, because... I co-produced that one, too, so... Mm. You know, I have sightings. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, Speaking of evidence, too, he's been a, a... Obviously, a primary collaborator throughout your career. Oh well, Ev. I mean, man, Ev is the the. He's the heart of, you know, he he's the the partner to everything. I wouldn't even be in the game necessarily. I wouldn't have had the opportunity if it weren't for E Swift. But then I wouldn't have made a name for myself if it wasn't for Evidence. And explain why how and why your relationship with both of them developed the way that it did and became so powerful? Well, I was the last member to be heralded liquid, um, right, you know, literally right after Exhibit and accepted by the brothers. And the first record we did was Big Up, myself and E. Swift. And that came together through Immortal Records and, Happy Walters and everybody over there at the time. And from that record, Swift and I were now, man, we were we were connected in unity, man. Connected. He was like, All right, I stamp you, I knight you. <laughs> Liquid. <laughs> You're in a circle. What else you what else you got going on? Mm-hmm. And so but keep in mind the alcoholics are recording their own albums. Uh exhibits recording his records. King T is doing what he's doing. So I still had to make a name for myself. So Big Up was just a a little tiny pebble still in a big ocean. Right. So I had to come with Bionic. I had to get on my good foot. And and all of that is evidence. And, and, you know, cut Master Kurt, man. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And then Alchemist comes into play for Focus Daily. And then that was it, man. You know, that was it. So Swift literally gave me the opportunity to establish a platform right and a stamp a platform with a stamp and then ev blessed me with the work okay d i got these works let's do it let's get it done Mm -hmm. you know and he was a hungry producer at the time dilated trying to do their thing bionic had such a success that that opened up dilated's eyes to abb which was a label I co-founded. So it was just, it was all the right timing for stuff going on with those two central characters, though, E. Swift and Evidence. Right. And I think, too, both of them don't get a lot of recognition like they should as far as, especially on production, I think. But E. Swift really as a rapper either. Like, I think people forget that Swiftzilla. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's uh, you know, when he chooses to participate. Well, like you talk about odds and evens. I have him on Inner City, which yeah. is, that's one of my favorite songs to perform to this very day. I do okay. Swift's parts, but he kills it on there. Absolutely. So that's always been a thing that's that's intriguing. And as talking about, um, you know, by the time odds and evens had come out, you'd already been on the, the 2001 album and you'd already been on Restless with Exhibit. Yeah. So, um just for comparison's sake, what what do you see since you've been with so many producers and many of the top tier producers in the game? Like, how is the techniques and the things that the E Swifts versus the Evidence versus the Dr. Dre's? Like, what is the what is the difference? Well, I I think one thing the, I think the the main thread for the MC dealing with any of those producers Mm -hmm. is that the MC MC should be a pro and the MC should know what they're doing. Right. Um, And the MC should have, should be unabashed. I mean, know what you're doing and go for it. Mm -hmm. Period. Um, Ask for forgiveness later. (laughs) Do it. You can always do another take. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Don't ask what you can do. Do it. Mm Mm-hmm. It's always better to do it and then ask for forgiveness than it is to ask if you can do it. And so, um, and how'd you learn that musically? Or is that just, who I think, you know, I think that comes from my sports background. I think that comes okay. from playing my whole life, you okay. know, and, and knowing that if you want to take a spot, go take it. Mm-hmm. You feel me? You can ask the coach all you want, but you got to take it. Um, and so with Dre, 
ex called me. He's like, D, what you doing? I'm like, what's up? He's like, come through. I'm like, for sure. He's like, make sure you pull up, Dolo, though. I'm like, yeah, that's what I do anyway. So I pull up. I get there, and the song's up, and it already has King T and X are already on it. You know, Hitman's on it, and Cocaine, and Nocturnal. And I'm like, oh, it's 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 basically a liquid song. This right. was my thinking. Okay. So I quickly noticed how they were rhyming and what they did. Their first four bars is a, is a classic, old, a classic L.A. verse. Right. So you know what I did, Soren? I took I took my OGs. Right. Inspiration, Ice T, who I love that brother to death. That's I mean that that's my guy. And uh, I took his six in the morning and I flipped it up. And so. I had eight bars. I said it. And Dre said, say that again. I'm like, five in the morning, burglars at my door. Glock 45 in my dresser drawer. He's like, you want to get in the booth? I'm like, shit, do Kobe want the ball, man? <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, I want to get in the booth. All right. And so that was that. Oh, so you didn't even go there to make, you were just going to hang. I was going there because X had come through. Oh. Strictly. Gotcha. And, 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 and man. The Father God used the exhibit for, for the most monumental opportunity in my career. Right. Which was such a blessing. And so now take take making um any song with E Swift. Mm-hmm. E Swift, it was always a collaborative thing. We would always Before we get to that though, when once you got in the booth, like what was going on? Or well, I laid it? down the eight. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't even remember doing doubles. I probably did, though. Okay. And I told him, hold up, I got four more. You know, I'm trying to get my 12. As you should. <laughs> As you should. So I'm getting, I'm trying to get my 12. I'm writing. He's playing it back, though. And then he comes over. You know, he comes over to the IFB. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think we got it. I think that's it. And, you know, when the good doc says that's it, you like. It's a wrap. All right. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Keep it moving. He was super cool, man. He was like, man, make sure you see my business people on the way out. I was like, okay. The whole time I'm thinking, this this ain't coming out. Mm. I had already done songs with Quick that never came out. My own crew. I did I, I did a gang of songs with the Alcoholics, never came out. All kind of people, songs would never come out. That's just part of rap. Right. Especially then it was. Absolutely. You know, nowadays you just put the song out. But back then, nah, mm-mm. everything is not coming out. Right. So the good old days. Right. <laughs> um, so I went about my way, man, and then months later, I see the bus bench across from Inglewood High. Mm. When I get off work. How ironic. With my name on it, I'm like, that's a fade. I'm like, yeah, that's a fade right there. So you know, but having said that, that was literally no different as a producer. Mm-hmm. Then working with E Swift or same thing with F. Okay. It might have been a fancier facility. The facility might have been a little fancier. A few more bells and whistles. Or a lot. <laughs> or a lot more fancy. <laughs> I'll be honest. Yes. But uh I recorded Bionic at uh, Herb Albert where they recorded uh We Are the World. I recorded Bionic in the same room. Wait, is that the A and M place? What do you mean? Wow. Sorry? Of course it is. Okay. Swift knew the engineer. Mm. And, and he it was a down day. Mm. It was a down day. We slid up in there, recorded Bionic in the same room that Quincy Jones makes We Are the World. Wowzers. Yeah, so actually that facility was probably more fancier <laughs> than Dre's mm. than Larrabee at the time because okay. that's where we recorded that was right, at Larrabee, right. Larrabee uh, North yeah I think it was Larrabee North or the regular Larrabee okay. in West Hollywood okay and you know Ev and I we recorded all over the place uh, Red Fool's House mm-hmm. I, I remember <laughs> um, so many different studios Kitchen Sink Sound Castle a lot of my records were recorded there to in the present day we recorded Rare Poise at um uh, Enzo's Garage in Venice. Mm. Keeping it local. Yeah, Enzo Peretta. <laughs> Keeping it super local. <laughs> yeah, man. And Enzo, he's only two years old. Or about, well, is he three now? He's three. But uh, he owns one of the best studios in, in the town. It's good for him. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, too, it's it's interesting, like I was saying earlier, about the the gangster rap world versus the quote-unquote non-gangster rap world of L.A., but... 
you and others have been able to, you know, navigate, navigate the worlds, but not only navigate, but excel when you step in those different waters. Yeah. And that's something I think is a, you know, a testament to you as an artist, but also people's not really understanding that the dudes that may not rap gangster rap are of the same world, essentially. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's just like hooping, man. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Uh, You grow up hooping. I mean, I tell people this all the time. Being born and raised in L.A., you did one of three things. You either gang bang, you either hustle, or you play sports. The fourth thing was you stayed in the house. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? So you wanted to be outside, you had to be one of those, the athlete, the hustler, or the or the, or the gang banger. And we all went to school together. We all played sports together. So it's it's really no different mm-hmm. being in on a on a on a on a gangster rap album, or a alcoholics album, or an exhibit album. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? There was there was no difference. It was just yo, put the beat up. Let's get it. You know what I mean? And then. Uh, I've had a lot of great experiences with my dad in rap, which is somewhat surprising, but I do remember um in it would have been two thousand uh two thousand one I think, but you were touring with exhibit and you guys the first in Europe and then your first stop back happened to be in Chicago, and I was there House of blues the House of blues yeah man. And uh, I'll never forget this. This was so funny. Like, you, I remember you there. You, me, and my dad <laughs> and Exhibit were in the back. And I, my dad had never been, I, you know, my dad had never been around that volume of weed before. <laughs> and I'll never forget, my dad is so hilarious. But he said, I said, oh, man, Dad, I'm sorry all the smoke, you know. And he's like, and this is 2001. Yeah. And my dad said, oh, don't worry. I'm sure it's for medicinal purposes. And he just laughed like, yeah, whatever. But it was just, nice. it was so funny because <laughs> I was so excited to be able to, one, achieve the status I had, but then be able to bring my dad, who was cool about it, and get to introduce him to people like yourself and Exhibit. Yeah. And, you know, he's gotten to know Exhibit a little bit over the years here and there, but just to be able to take him to the show was so yeah, it meant a lot to me. I know he was like these cats are blow. <laughs> yeah, he's like whoa. He was he's like, like how can they get up there? How can they do these shows? <laughs> they are beyond intoxicated and inebriated. I tell people man the, the the level of cowboying. Yes. You got to be built for it, man. <laughs> you, you can't be It ain't this, easy. <laughs> no. Nah, you can't be in this rap sport and and man look how beautiful how beautiful God's grace is. I've been to so many places all over the world for for rap. Man. For rap music. Yeah. Something that my grandmother and them said, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Or, or, or really going back, because I began in the game as a DJ in the seventh grade. They said rap wouldn't last past five years. You remember, son. Of course. So for it to take me around the world several times over, and and touch so many different cultures and so many different people. They don't even speak English, but they knew my songs. I mean, the power of the music, man, and everything is just wow. Still to this day, it's mind blowing. But I only bring that up to tell people that you cannot endure the rigor of that if you're not built for it. Right. And as someone who's never drank, smoked, done any drugs or anything, just being around it and having to secondhand understand and appreciate the levels that uh certain friends of mine at your circle included of that <laughs> yeah. it's just like wow because <laughs> it's just because you're, you're like how are these guys even remembering the songs yeah because I, <laughs> I mean you know this far I, I mean i used to lightweight tour with the alcoholics yeah absolutely so i would be with you guys so much and i just remember one time driving back done a show in Anaheim I think it was and we drove down to San Diego you weren't there on this but I'm just saying like drive down to San Diego do the show drive back and I'm with with everybody and then there was another time Exhibit had done a show in uh, Anaheim at the House of Blues Yeah, and it was the biggest 
uh, I don't even remember what year this was, but it was like literally at the time the biggest bag of weed I'd ever seen anyone just <laughs> carrying, <laughs> just carrying with them. Not, not like oh I'm about to roll this up. It was like one of those gallon Ziploc bags when that's weed ca- wasn't even like a, that. That's called a pillow. Sir. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I remember it wasn't even like, and he was like, hey, sword. <laughs> and I was like, X, man, you're killing me over here. Yeah, oh, man, forget about it. And then, of course, <laughs> what what the crew is named after, that's a whole other level, too. Yeah, oh, man. But good times, man. Absolutely. A lot of great times. You got to be built for that stuff, man. Yeah, even everybody was always like, man, I'm surprised you're not like, super high yourself just from all, all being around it all yeah and people always think that i because of hanging out with everybody man soren what what do you like to well smoke? and then you're kind of like a slow you well, you try to be smooth soren you know <laughs> but you're kind of like a slow try to be smooth talker kind of cat okay <laughs> well break that down the far what, what are you trying to say so it's easy it's easy for people to think like you know you're fresh off a of fronto leaf and you know <laughs> <laughs> couldn't be further from the truth <laughs> but that being said yes so uh as your career progressed you've been putting out uh you know steady stream of music but i think it's also important for people to understand the other world that you really got into uh starting getting into the world of sound yeah. working in television in particular and extra because yeah. that was the first knowledge i had uh of you getting into this world and doing sound yeah so we're going to go through a lot of the shows that you've done but how and why did that opportunity come to where that was something that you know you needed needed wanted had interest in whatever it was well i saw where the game was going you know the peaks and valleys of rap had seemingly the peaks had come and gone Mm mm-hmm <clears throat> and I was g- getting into these valleys of a, a prolonged time, and me being a father of two and married for going on 19 years. Congratulations. Thank you, man. Um, you know, I had to do something, and, and fortunately I had the mindset where I can look ahead of the game and, and see that I need to be doing something different and a change of pace. So uh, a good buddy of mine, Sammy, uh, got me in over there to meet the production manager. And I got on there at the bottom mm-hmm. over at, at Extra. I was a, a PA or a runner only for about maybe a year. Then I left and I was still touring. So we're talking 06, 07, which is right. kind of like the last of my European tours. By then I was going to Europe by myself. I would pick a DJ up out there. And I would just run, I would stay in Amsterdam for like three days, three of my down days, and I would just run all through Europe. And um, when I got back, they really didn't have nothing for me. So they hired me on as uh, the music supervisor, interim. Okay. I think the music supervisor at the time, his wife had had a surgery or something, and he had to be away. So I got on as an interim music supervisor, and then they came into my office, and they were like... um, we want to hire you full-time staff. And once they did that, I was still staffed as a PA. And then I just picked up a bag and put a bag together, learned the, learned the field mixers, learned the wireless lavaliers and stuff like that. And I started going out on shoots. And then before long, they crewed me up. Hmm. And so for the fir- uh, first couple of years of my sound mixing endeavors, I was crewed up with a gentleman named uh, Josh Vick. And then... When they moved from the stage environment to outdoors, they moved to the Grove. Mm -hmm. Then I was a stage mixer. I I became the stage mixer, and and Vic was the second camera out there. And so uh, I mixed all the years at the Grove, and then I mixed for the first three years at Universal as well, the stage mixer. And for people to understand, like, you did more than a 1,000 shows. So this is not like, you know, they were... You know, looking at you on you know the weekend shoots or something. Nah, this is like it was every real, day, real yeah. deal. Yeah, it was a day. It's a you know daily show with Mario Lopez, and I even did. I even mixed his extra at the movies stuff. Mm. Uh, mixed the weekend show, you know. Um, and so all all the interviews he had on stage, I mixed all of those. I mixed bands. 
I had the I had the the fortunate experience of being able to mix Stevie Wonder out of the mm-hmm. Grove for wow. the, for the little Christmas special. Congratulations, um, that's big. Yeah, man, I was damn near crying. Mm-hmm. And, and my headphones on, I'm just like sitting there, like I couldn't believe because he's singing "Overjoyed." Oh, and that's wow. one of my favorite songs. I'm like. I can't believe what I'm hearing. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> Just don't hit mute. Just don't hit mute. Um, so I was on at Extra for about 11 years mm-hmm. uh, total. And then I've been freelancing since 2000, uh, August of 2017. And then what did you, why do sound or why do production work instead of uh, looking into teaching? It, it, it goes back to my initial statement, how I never really dug the gig of it, and I always dug the kids. But the kids need us more now. Than I now. know, brother. <laughs> I know. I'm not, I'm not saying that I nor you are, are, are not needed. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't force yourself to be somewhere that you're not necessarily happy. True. You know, and miserable, because that will adversely affect the kids it affects everything absolutely so man coming from a dj background coming from the music world Mm -hmm. where we had very rigorous standards for sound in television it's not that rigorous right you're just under the gun more in television but the actual quality of the sound you know if i'm in the studio for an album i'll mix your lead vocal soaring for hours trying to get it right Right, right. And television is not like that. I got to get this interview good, and it's either it's either overmodulated or it's not. It's in the levels or it's not. You got it. <laughs> it's e- it's either usable or, or it's not. not. Right. <clears throat> so, um, I did that, and man, was fortunate enough to be smart enough again because I knew uh, they they had huge layoffs over there. You know, like most shows do when they're running out, mm-hmm. they go through sweeping layoffs. So I had survived like three of them. I'm like, well, my I know my time is probably up. I'm at right. the top of the food chain for sound mixers at the company. And um, lo and behold, it was up. But I was smart enough to get in the union before mm-hmm. I left. And because uh, I had enough hours with the with the non-union. It was a non-union show, but I had enough hours, mm. you know. And payroll helped me out and show proof of that. And, yeah, I've been freelancing ever since. So for people... You know, unions used to be really big in the United States and have slowly, steadily been dwindled, dwindled away in most lines of work, but in entertainment, they're still very strong. Absolutely. So for people that don't understand what a union is, how it helps you, like explain from your perspective why being in a union is helpful, beneficial, something that if people have the chance to, they should look into. Well, for what I do Mm -hmm. as a location sound mixer or a production sound mixer, if I wasn't in a union, I couldn't get on the lots. Mm -hmm. So if there's a show on the lot, like I've done, you know, Drop the Mic or uh, Master Chef. Insecure. Yeah, Insecure or Master Chef or um, any union show, I'd be asked out if I wasn't in the 695. So even though they do not, I repeat, they do not get us work. Mm -hmm. They do not get us work. We got to find our own work. But at the same time, a production manager couldn't call me from a union show if I wasn't 695. That's the only reason to be in. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, if you're working a lot, you know, they have medical benefits and, you know, um, you can get a 401k through the union, credit union, all that type of stuff. Uh, But, it's really there's a lot of guys out there who are not in it just because of that because it costs a lot to join and they've been doing fine without it they've never not uh been able to get on a job without it you know what i mean because there's a lot of non-union work there's a lot of non-union shows yeah and then like a show like drop the mic i remember would hire both union and non-union people Hmm. but in my position everybody was was union okay yeah certain positions everybody is, is, is union. Now, you've obviously been a a fan and consumer of music and entertainment throughout your entire career. As Absolutely. Well, long before your career started, just like myself. Man. But for you, speaking specifically on Drop the Mic and on Insecure, I want to talk a little bit about each one. Right. With, with Insecure, that show is uh, 
you know, it's a very distinctive show and it's a different show in a lot of ways than we've seen before. So for you, what is the importance or significance of that type of show being on the air in this era? Oh, man, that is the only show that I've ever seen that literally accurately captures the post-graduate, post-college graduate black male and female in L.A. experience. Mm. It captures it. it. It captures how we came up, how we grew up, how all of us who went away to school and came back home or those who went to UCLA or SC, it, it, it just captures L.A. really, really good. It's through the, through the vernacular they use, through the different landmarks they go to, uh, and Issa Rae being born and raised in L.A., she just she captures it. She's really good at doing that. I told her that. I'm like, no other show has truly captured our experience where when I watch your show, Issa, you make me feel like you you literally are talking to me. Mm. You know, it's the only show ever that I felt like that, uh, being black from L.A. And um, that, for me, was a tremendous uh, you know honor to be... You know, I did utility sound for that show uh, as as a good buddy of mine is the mixer on that show. But, man, that's, that's the only show that I've ever been a part with that just captured it like that. Okay. Captured what I knew as a black male born and raised in L.A. who went to college. And I think to your point, the one way that I felt that way for different reasons, but the same end result was when she's living in the apartment and right. one dude is blood this, you know, everything is be. But she and her friends and her circle don't talk like that. Right. But I think, to your point, a lot of people probably get this warped sense of reality that everyone's out there, you know, gangbanging or talking this or that, and then that show shows you, like, no, that's a segment of the population. Yeah. It's not the entire black population yeah and then it's also showing that okay she got a college education but here she is still struggling right still struggling to try to make it it's not like that for all of her friends because her one friend's a lawyer and you know right. how it goes but i just think it captures man the, the the whole uh diaspora if you will of the different types of black post-college graduates mm -hmm. you know and, and i like it for that you know, along with the nuances of the city, too, nowadays. Right, right. Like how she's a Lyft driver. And, right. You know, all that stuff. Multiple hustles. Right. And that, uh, speaking of graduation, you know, and I've talked to Method Man about his show, Drop the Mic, that he has. And one of the many things once I saw, because I just saw the credits that you were on that show. I didn't No one told me or whatever. I was watching the show one time, and it was like, Meth is the host. Murs is doing rap coaching yeah. or whatever they call yeah, it. Mur Murs had a few apps. Newmark is the DJ. What do you slash mean? The house band Keep going. slash you're missing, everything. You're missing the creator of the show. Newmark created the no, show? No, 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 no. Oh. Yeah. Hot Carl. Hot Carl create. Well, okay. But <laughs> but we talking rap. Yes. We, we yes, talking hip hop. We talking hip hop. Rap, rap specifically. But then, and then you were on the sound, so I'm like, wait a second. There's all these different yeah, man. people that, other than Hot Carl, I know all of them. Right. And they're all working on the show in drastically different ways. And I just thought that, that that, to me, was amazing. So for you, just looking at it as a a rap fan or something, to see that there's these different jobs, these different opportunities that when we were growing up, that would have never happened. No, no. But so there's an irony to that. Break Sorry. it down. <clears throat> what you said is is absolutely correct. I mean, that show provided a platform for like like meth. I'm, I'm working alongside meth mm -hmm. on a show in a professional platform, you know. Right. Newmark. You know, we're all these different technicians, you know, on a show, which otherwise we may never had have had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But the irony of it is, as true hip hop heads, meth is a true hip hop head. Absolutely. Of course, you know, DJ Newmark is. And then myself, it goes without saying, you mentioned MERS 
You're talking true hip hop heads, not not necessarily just rap. True hip hop guys. Mm-hmm. The irony of it is that we're working in this environment of facetiousness, if you will. Gotcha. You know, it's battle rap. It's a tongue in cheek. Yeah, it's battle yeah. rap, but it's not real battle rap. Right. It's it's you know. Yeah, because when um, <laughs> just like when Busy B and Kumo D had their thing, there was no confusion that that was not a friendly competition. Right. Or what Kumo D did, I should say. Right. Because it wasn't a competition. It was a blind. It was a haymaker blindside. Yeah, yeah. But that stuff is not the same as what we're seeing there. No, I mean, you know, and and so. For me, no big deal because I'm behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. But for Meth, he was really, he he's so confident and, and comfortable in his own who he is that it didn't matter. And I love how he exudes that mm-hmm. on Drop the Mic. He goes 110 as the host. Right. And and the authority, even though he knows, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but he never once is any of his integrity compromised. Well, and he and I have talked about this, but I think it's important that I've heard and seen and whatever, people saying negative things about the show, but on the flip side, Method Man explained to me, which I agree with this perspective, is that there's so many kids that will watch that show because of who's on it. Absolutely. That don't know who, just to use a name that Method and I were talking about, like Mob Deep. Right. That will, because someone mentioned Mob Deep on the show, oh, Who's Mob Deep? What's this Havoc and Prodigy? And then they're like, oh, wow. And they'll have an opportunity that they wouldn't have had otherwise or wouldn't have been, you know, spur of the moment, look up a Mob Deep or whoever. And that's what I'm saying. For somebody to be an icon like himself in the music. Right. To take that and shoulder that responsibility, you know, of authenticity mixed with this sideshow of things going on. And it still come off dope, you know. It's just like, man, kudos to Meth, you know, the coolest dude. I mean, it's it's no question that you could ever question uh, uh, Meth's track record, right. you know. So I lo- I love to see cats expanding their brand with no reservations, right? You know, and and with no compromise either. So man, drop the mic was dope for that man, a one of a kind thing. And I mean, come on, man, I. You know, I, I had the Muppets, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mic'd the Muppets, man. <laughs> you know, I, I mixed Kermit and Piggy and all that, man. Yes. That was like a big career a milestone for me. Stevie man. Wonder and the Muppets, man. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you got to work the angles. Absolutely. You got to work the angles. <laughs> or the Sharp dilated. and precise. Yes. <laughs> Remix and otherwise. Yeah, man. That being said, you're... You know, we're talking music here, of course, with the far here on the Soren Baker show, and you're still recording, still active. Yes, making got, music. Got a new album, man, on 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 its way this summer. All right, called Every Step. Break it down. Yeah, produced by Dirty Diggs, uh, featuring the likes of uh, Phil the Ag, uh, Barbershop SK, Chase Infinite, um, Evidence, uh, Damani and Kosi. Um, yeah, man, got some good stuff going on. The follow up to Solamente. Mm-hmm. Um, the far eye every step is coming out this summer yeah well we're we're look, looking forward to that we'll, we'll have to bring you back for that too absolutely um because you know it's it's you know we need to make sure to discuss and and you know sh- shine light on a lot of this great music that we have the benefit you of creating me of enjoying but you so know, much too th- yeah so, there's so, so much, much. but i'm sharper than ever so i like you know, Solamente, <clears throat> my last album, which I, I just put out in October, um, is is that is such a gem. It's the type of album that people will come back to years later and they will realize, wow. No, I agree. He was <laughs> on one on this. You know, I'm sharper than ever, man. Lyrically, it's just, man, it, there's no beat I can't master. It's, but that's... Uh, I'm at a good place. But what got you to that place? You know, being free, Soren, and I think not primarily not depending on the music for income, Mm. not depending on the music for revenue to pay my bills, a sense of freedom, Soren. And 
rare poise is where you start to hear it. <clears throat> when you get rare poise uh, produced by evidence, the entire album, that, that was a, a, a sentimental project because I, I always wanted to leave my core fans with the album produced entirely by evidence. Mm. So they couldn't say I didn't do that or they, they couldn't gotcha. say, oh man, you should have, you should have did this. Okay, here it is. And uh, Rare Poise, man, is a sign of my new freedom. Well, that being said, I do think... Lyrically. Well, I also think, I was going to say also delivery-wise, mm. I think there's a certain, and I don't know if it's the 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 freedom aspect of it. Maybe that's exactly what I'm hearing or what I was hearing at the time, but it definitely seems there's a certain comfort that you have. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's not necessarily in the earlier part of your career. Absolutely, Sean. You you nailed it. That's it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I couldn't have said it any better. I'm free, man. And and even Ev, he marvels at it now because mm -hmm. you know he's working on his new album. And uh, even when we were doing uh, Whether or Not, you know he marvels at how free I am because it's difficult for him, you know, to just let go. Right. And man, I can, you know, now I'm I'm better. My flows are infinite. Mm -hmm. I can flow on any beat, pretty much any way I want to. Mm -hmm. And simply put, if you're listening out there, it's an attitude of I don't care. Right. That's why. You well, know, there's a mean? lot of power in not caring. Yeah, man. It it, it kind of gave me more leverage in within the four, more leverage within the eight of the beat trying different things and then on rare poise i told ev you all these you're the ep you're the executive producer on this record you mm -hmm. tell me what to do okay and um all the beats you know he chose and he, he was telling me you know what to do i was like i'm all ears just tell me what to do because that was an exercise that i wanted to hmm. be successful at too not you know being an aquarius we're always hands-on on everything and Sometimes we have a problem of trying to dominate things, but that exercise I wanted to complete of, nah, I'm listening. You know, I'm coachable. You know, to, and going back to hooping again. You know <laughs> right. what I mean? What do you want me to execute? Right. And I'll go out there and get it done. You know, and then I would throw my two cents in. You know. Yes, yeah, it's, it's funny when, t you know, when people realize that. Power actually comes from needing less. Yeah. Because then you're not reliant on any of these other things to drive you or to shape your thoughts. Exactly. It's a very powerful realization. It is, And man. once you have it, you do have a, sense, uh, a type of absolute or true power that is hard for most to achieve. Man, it's just the best way I can explain it is just, man, I, uh, it's just free. I'm free, man. I'm free to rhyme about anything, any way I want, free to sing if I want, free to, man, just be musical mm -hmm. in the truest sense, you know. Um, not making the music for me. That's the one thing. I never, I never made the music for me because I... Going back to People's Choice, the song, that's what that's about. Right. It's the people that choose. You know, I'm just fortunate. You know, I'm just blessed. But the people chose. You know, I could have put out records and nobody ever chose one song. Mm -hmm. You know, so just to be that fortunate. I, I, I thought Drake's uh, Grammy speech. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought it was right on time. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very poignant and powerful because he broke it down you know and it was he he didn't have to say i'm i'm saying this because of all the times i've been snubbed he didn't need to right what he said said that you know he said this is cool and all but the guy who gets off work and drives in the snow to my show that's who i care about you right. know he, he said all the people who who've traveled so far and near and wide to get to my shows and man if it wasn't for y'all you know so he said he's like this is cool 
But this ain't even what it's about. And right. I love that. And you notice they cut him and then they ran the music and they, they went to commercial real fast. <laughs> um, but, man, he got that off. He did. Definitely. He said a lot for a lot of us who on the artistry tip of music. That's why we do it. Right. You know, for somebody to choose. Well, congratulations on that going and still going strong, Defar. Man, I'm trying, my brother. So, Defar, how do people find you on social media, man? Oh, man, they can find me at Mr. Underscore Defar. Uh, That's on Twitter or Instagram, Mr. M-R underscore D-E-F-A-R-I. My Instagram is is one big site of, of uh, for music lovers and music lovers only um music aficionados i mean i'm putting up new covers of albums that that i personally love and that are personally in my collection i do it every day um just trying to share music with the world hashtag love music Mm -hmm. um nothing more than that hashtag love music and um so you can find that on my instagram you know twitter you already know what it is a few thoughts here or there um and yeah man mr underscore defara well there it is y'all the far has joined us here on the soren baker show thank you very much for coming through sir oh, soren thanks for having me man yeah we'll get you back when the album is ready absolutely and, uh we'll get that going but i'm soren baker thank you all for watching on unique access and listening on the digital soapbox network we appreciate it we'll catch you next week on the soren baker show yeah, he is the soren baker yeah. the one and only <laughs> soren baker yes